Hello, welcome to Keeping It Classless Labs. My name is Matt Oswalt, and today we're going to be talking about UCS Central. Now, UCS Central's been out for a while. 1.0, I believe, was released about a year ago, if not more. Uh, in fact, it was announced at Cisco Live 2012. Now, UCS Central is a tool to centrally manage your UCS domain. So let's say you have a UCS domain in one data center and then another UCS domain in another data center. You would want to be able to manage those sort of, uh, you know, under a single pane of glass. UCS Central essentially allows you to do that. So a little bit of technical background on this. I, uh, I, uh, UCS Central 1.1 is out now, and that's the version that I will be using. And that means that we'll have to be using UCS Manager 2.1, parentheses or dot, whatever you want to call it, 2A. So 2.1, 2A. Now, the interesting part about all this is I actually don't have any physical gear at the moment. So what I did was I set up two instances of the UCS emulator, which is free for download. I believe you only need a CCO account. I don't think there's any entitlement rules around that. And UCS Central, which probably does have some sort of entitlement rules, but uh, in the sake of learning, I'm sure that a, your, your friendly neighborhood account manager can hook you up. What I'm first going to do is show you how not to install UCS Central. Now, I have an ESXi host. It's a standalone host. It's part of my lab. And as you can see, it's got uh, a few other virtual machines that we're not going to be dealing with today. And I've already uploaded the OVA template for UCS Central onto this host. And in case you've never done that before, it's real simple. You just simply collect, uh, click Deploy OVF Template up here, and you select the OVF Template. Uh, you know, I have it stored on my desktop, so that's pretty simple. Uh, once it's been deployed, now I have an NFS sort of, uh, it's actually a QNAP storage array, uh, very small. It's like four disks. And that connects over a 100 megabit switch. And, that, and the reason I'm telling you that is, is the, that's going to be important to note here in a second. So once we've deployed it, I'm going to power it on. First thing we run into is, and this is a limitation on my end, uh, this particular host does not have four, uh, four uh, CPUs. It's actually got a single processor, and uh, it's only a dual core. So this is actually a really old machine. I selected this machine specifically because I wanted to show you the limitations on, uh, v on UCS Central. The number of virtual CPUs that you that uh, it pr it provisions by default is four. So the first thing we need to do is if you are running this on some some sort of host like that, is go in and uh, essentially change that to two. So now we should be able to at least power it on. over to the console so it's booting up right now and uh, I'll pause the video now just so that you don't have to uh, watch the whole boot up process we will resume when we're at a prompt so this is what I was going to show you guys real quick the average disk read speed measured is 9 I'm assuming that's in megabytes per second as it's shown down here 75 is the required specification for UCS Central so 9 is not cutting it that works out to about 72 well yeah 72 megabits per second which kind of makes sense seeing as it's a 100 megabit switch. So uh, that combined with the fact that we're not conforming to the recommended CPU specifications, which is four CPUs, we're basically running in uh, a less than desirable performance. I originally installed on this host thinking that, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe it won't work if I throw a huge load at it, but in a lab environment, it's okay. Not the case. I threw. I, I only tried to register UCS Manager uh, on this UCS Central instance, and I ran into problems even with just the registration on one UCS Manager instance. So it's not a matter of load. It just does not work. It does not work if you don't give it the resources it needs. Um, overkill maybe, but you know it is what it is. What we're gonna do is install UCS Central in uh, v, in uh, VMware Workstation, which is locally installed here. Bring that up. Um, so here, I'm actually, it, ironically, my local PC has more capabilities than my, uh, than my ESXi host. So what we just need to do is um, actually just double-click the OVA I've got over on my desktop. We get this store the new virtual machine or import, import virtual machine wizard. Makes it real simple for us. So it starts to, uh, to uh, import. So the OVA is deployed, and we now have access to the uh, UCS Central wizard here. This is the first uh, message that comes up. As you can see, the disk's uh, read speed measured is 233. I'm just using a local disk for this since it's a workstation, so much better performance. Uh, the first uh, item that looks like we're, we're uh, required to enter is we just want to set up a new configuration, so we'll type setup. 
UCS Central VM ETH0 IPv4 address. I'll use my own little address that I got here. Pretty straightforward stuff. This is very similar to what you would expect to see from like, um, you know, the UCS management configuration. 10.12.0.1. So uh, the clustering actually works very similarly. In fact, if you get into the command line of UCS Central, you can do, uh, it's, it's I, I'm probably going to butcher the syntax, but it's something like uh, cluster lead A or cluster lead B, very similar to how you do failover for uh, between Fabric Interconnects in a UCS domain. Um, so you could set up two UCS Central virtual machines and, uh, you know, say, you know, have one on one host and, and one on another host. Proper design would implicate that you say, you know, you, you are, or it would imply that you put uh, affinity rules into vSphere DRS, if that's what you're using. That way the two virtual machines don't ever, you know, come onto the same host, things like that. So all of that is possible with this. Since it's just a learning opportunity for us, we're not going to bother with it, so we'll do standalone. UCS Central VM hostname, uh, UCS sent test. Sounds good. So I have a DNS server on my network. It's 10.12.0.11. Uh, Oops, num lock. So default domain name, uh, I have a, an Active Directory se uh, domain set up here, which we won't be using, but just for the sake of it, I'll type it in. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm using, uh, I'm doing a few things with performance testing, but more on that later. Um, use a shared storage device for database. Yes, no. Uh, let's say no. I, I, I imagine in a production environment you would want this, um, but we this is a simple workstation install, so we'll say no. Enforce strong password. Uh, let's say no, even though I want to say yes, because I just want to type Cisco UCS for the password. Cisco UCS. Shared secret. Let's do also Cisco UCS. This lab environment is not secure. Do you want statistics collection, yes or no? The statistics collection uh, ability is actually pretty cool. You can gather statistics on uh, like networks, network stats, things like that on all of your registered UCS domains. Um, you can even get like, you know, hourly, daily, and weekly data in reports. Um, you can customize these reports, it's actually pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, these are not uh, real UCS domains, so we won't really have any good data, so I'm actually gonna say no here. Just keep in mind if you have real equipment, it's uh, something that you might wanna play with. Uh, proceed with this configuration. Please confirm. Yes. So it's going to go through and uh, write the config and probably do a few other things. So uh, I'm going to pause again. We'll resume when we get back to the uh, login screen. All right. So we're, we are presented with a login prompt with uh, Cisco ECS Central. Um, in fact, we could log in if we wanted to at this point. We can type in uh, our username of admin. Password is Cisco ECS, if we recall. And we're presented with a command line, which is quite sim uh, quite similar to what you would expect in like a UCS domain. In fact, you can do uh, connect, and uh, you can connect to the various managers of UCS Central. Can't do things like NXOS. You, you know, UCS Central doesn't run NXOS. It, it uh, runs some other magic, unlike the Fabric Interconnect. So there's a few things that are different, but some of the, some of the same things you'll find are similar. Um, however, this video is not about the, the uh, command line. It's about the GUI interface. So let's load that up. So if we reload this page, 10.12.0.25, you got your security certificate uh, warning there for Chrome. And we now have our UCS Central page, version 1.1, 1A, that's cool. Admin, Cisco, and UCS. So this is a freshly configured UCS Central system. Not a lot to it. Um, for those that haven't seen UCS Central, um, I highly recommend you download this and, and just you know start to poke around. You'll you'll find that the layout is very similar to UCS Manager. There's a lot of differences, but you'll notice that there's an equipment tab, there's a servers tab, uh, there's a network tab, storage, you know, LAN and SAN is what it's called in UCS Manager. So there's a lot of similarities here. There's a lot of differences too. Keeping in mind that this tool is primarily aimed at providing some sort of a centralized uh, management tool. So. We're going to go through a bunch of different use cases, but I just wanted you to—I wanted you to see the interface. That's pretty simple. Um, I will preface with this with the fact that I, I still don't see a ton of functionality in UCS Central, but um, you know, for the for, for the second only ever release, it's not—it's uh, not too terrible. So, in addition to UCS Manager, I also uh, have a few uh, Cisco UCS Manager uh, instances set up in an, in an emulator in my uh, ESXi environment. But uh, before I get too far into the UCS Manager portion of this, which is really 
quite simple when you talk about uh, UCS central integration. The first thing that I'd like to talk about real quick is the absolute necessity. I mean, in general, it's a good idea, but in this case, the absolute uh, the absolute necessity for reading the release notes of both of these products. First off, the release notes for Cisco UCS Central Release 1.1. .1, um, as uh, you know, in typical Cisco fashion, you can see the new software features. Um, there no obviously there's no new hardware features because UCS Central is not a new is not a hardware product. As uh, I said before, and it's worth reiterating, if you are using Cisco UCS release um, that's interesting. Got a typo. If you are using Cisco uh, UCS Central release 1.11a, you must be running Cisco UCS release 2.12a or higher, and that's your UCS manager on your Fabric Interconnects. And uh, that's the that's because that's the first firmware version that uh, allows for that integration, which is why my uh, emulators are at 2.12a. You can see that I have two of them here. Um, so I have those loaded up, but it's important that we it's, it's important that we look at the release notes because what this will tell us in 1.1 .1 is first of all it allows us to see all of the things that we are able to do within this new version of uh, of UCS Central. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of new features. So these are the kind of this is the kind of thing that you can uh, figure out by reading the release notes. You can see what all you, uh, you you're able to do. More importantly than that, I feel though is you can see still the open caveats, and there are quite a few in 1.1. .1. Um, a lot of them. I don't really, I'm not really concerned with since it's not a production system, but one of the ones that I did read uh, before was uh, things like, or actually known limitations and behaviors. These are, these are pretty numerous as well. Um, for instance, uh, when performing maintenance operations such as administrative failover or PMON restart on a UCS central VM running on VMware ESX, the file system goes into read-only state. Um, there's a few other vMotion errors that I saw before. Uh, if you uh, vMotion of VM. I can't remember where that went. Um, man, I thought I saw it before. Um, let me th let me type for vMotion. Let me see if I can find that. Yeah, running VMware vMotion, suspending a VM, or restoring a suspended VM on a Cisco UCS central VM that is currently the primary node in the cluster results in process crashes on the node, um, which is a really good example of what I was talking about earlier. You can type local management cluster lead v, which isn't the exact same to syntax as in UCS manager CLI, but um, it's basically the same thing. It's saying, hey, I want this other node in a cluster to serve as the primary. Um, and that allows you to keep your UCS central environment up and running rather than, you know, crashing. So definitely, definitely, definitely read through uh, this documentation. I also encourage you, even if you are using the emulator, to do the same thing for UCS manager software. Um, the 2.1 release has its own page as 2.0 did and all of the versions before it. So 2.1.2a is on the same version as 2.1. Uh, one A and through you know F, so um, read through this as well. Not a lot of open caveats there. Two one two A is a very very mature version of UCS Manager, but still a lot of things that you might want to be aware of. Um, UCS Central Integration obviously is one of those things that's been added. So huge 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 thing reading through all of these uh, all of these notes. A little bit tedious, but it's worth it, especially if you're running this stuff in production. So we're back in UCS Central, and I think uh, the first thing that I, I, I want to point out is that you don't actually integrate UCS uh, managers into UCS Central using the Central tool. You actually go into the UCS manager itself. So we'll bring up UCS DC1. You'll also notice that I have a second UCS manager, DC2. And these are both of my emulators that are installed on that ESXi host. So we go to the Admin tab, and we go to UCS Central down under Communication Management. And as you can imagine, we would probably click this link. The IP address for UCS Central is 10.12.0.25. Shared secret is Cisco UCS. So whenever you're getting a demo from this, you know, from Cisco on any on anything regarding UCS Central, you're definitely going to, to hear them talk about the fact that you can safely integrate with UCS Central um, from any UCS domain for the reason for the sheer reason that the default for this for all of these selections is local. So let's let's say uh, we had a global policy uh, for uh, DNS. Let's say we had a bunch of global DNS servers set up. Uh, if we were to switch this to global, then we would in, then we would pull down all of the uh, we would pull down the global DNS policy that's configured in UCS Central. Since it's set to local, uh, really nothing happens. Basically, this this local radio button says, "Hey, I don't want to do anything regarding UCS Central when it comes to infrastructure and catalog firmware. I'm just going to keep sticking with my stuff." The cool thing about this is you can register with UCS Central, get that out of the way first, and then get all your policies set up in UCS Central the way that you want. And as you figure out ways to, or, or if, as you, uh, you know, think of, of things that you would like to define globally, you can switch them over one at a time. Uh, 
as granular as this will allow you to. Now, there's a lot of other things that you can do with registering to UCS Central that aren't shown here. So don't take this as an exhaustive list of essentially features that UCS Central offers. These are simply policies that are derived globally or locally. So just keep that in mind. What we're going to do for now is just say set everything to local because all we want to do is register. We accept. Okay. So the if we go to the FSM tab real quick, you can notice that there's a that there's a process. And by the way, I mentioned before. Uh, oh yes. So this is perfect. UCS Central uh, and uh, UCSM, the time is not synchronized. So this is a perfect opportunity for us to get into UCS Central and do some configuring. Um, the first thing that I'd like to do is go to uh, the time zone management and set the uh, NTP server here. Uh, really any NTP server will do. I don't have one locally here. Uh, it's just easier for me to use my uh, clear OS server uh, without the HTTP. Time1.clearSDN.com, and that will allow this UCS manager to, to uh, pull the correct time. And as you can see, it resolves to uh, 8.02.341. Now, the time zone's wrong because it's not 3.41 in the morning here, uh, and I'm in Eastern time, so it's probably just because that time zone is, is Greenwich Mean Time by default when it's not set. That's my, that's my guess. So that's fine. We really only need the system time to be the same, uh, the same as UCS Central. So what we can do is go to UCS Central now. If you go to Operations Management, uh, Domain Groups, Operational Policies, Time Zone, Add an NTP Server, and uh, we'll do Time One again. Yeah, I forgot what it was. There we go, clearSDN.com. All right. So just to be clear, that last step wasn't necessary because the time was already 342. What this is going to do, and I'm actually going to do this as well, uh, I'm going to select, oh, which one did I want? America. Um, let's, let's see if we can find something in the Eastern time zone. Uh, Kentucky, I think, was in here. Louisville, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to save this, and uh, again, this is a this is a defined in the domain group root, so we can define another domain group to put our to put in our UCS domains um, if we wanted to, but there's no reason to do that here. I'm just going to put everything in the root. So essentially, when we move those UCS domains into that domain group, they're going to receive that operational policy for time zone. But again, remember, it won't do anything unless we've enabled that on our UCS central configuration. Um, I do want to note that uh, this this last task won't finish. In fact, it will fail very quickly and then loop back to this task, and it will infinitely loop if you if you don't uh, address the performance problems that we saw earlier. When I installed onto my ESXi host with not really great storage connectivity and you know less CPUs than it needed, whatever the reason, it just kept looping. So my my registration never happened. So very important to do that. Um, however, as we can see, we have a successful registration. If we go back to this tab, we can see that the registration status is registered. Um, now, the time zone policy is not going to be received here even, uh, for two reasons, actually. The first reason of which is we are not in an, any sort of domain group inside of UCS Central. So the first thing we want to do is, is, is place this domain into uh, a domain group. So if we click this domain, we say change group assignment expand, uh, well, there's no domain groups there. We just sel simply select root and click OK. That's fine. So now it's not ungrouped. It's part of the root domain group. It shows up there. Everything's great. Perfect. Uh, and the cool thing is from here, and I'm, you know, I'm just not used to seeing this. I'm so used to seeing the UCS domain uh, or the UCSM interface, but it's great to see that they've done a, uh, a, done a, you know, put in the effort to make sure that UCS Central looks pretty similar to UCS Manager. Not a huge learning curve when you're talking about simply navigating the GUI. So if we go back to UCS Manager, we have one more thing to do to get that time uh, policy to apply. Now we have the correct time because the, the NTP server we set manually here. But if you remember, we also set the time zone to Louisville, Kentucky. The time zone is not set here, so we're not receiving that global policy that we set in UCS Central. The way that we do that is in the definition of these policy resolutions. I mentioned that 
whenever a policy resolution is set to local, it essentially just uses whatever UCS is configured as. So long story short, this entire configuration simply ignores UCS Central. We're registered, but we don't really do anything with UCS Central. We don't inherit any policies. So if you can, if you can see this, time zone management is one, uh, one of these options. Uh, it determines whether the time zone and NTP server settings are defined locally or it comes from Cisco UCS Central. So not only did we define the same NTP server, so we're going to receive the, the NTP server that UCS Central provides. Uh, and you know what? What the heck? How about let's, let's add another one just to be sure. Let's do time two because I know that's one too. Clear SDN.com. We'll do two NTP servers. So the operational policies on the domain group that that, the, that that UCS domain is a part of right now is setting both these uh, both of these NTP servers, but it's also setting this time zone. So if we were to go back into UCS Manager, we're already registered, but now select Global when it comes to time zone management and click Save Changes. What it's going to do is it's going to reach up to UCS Central and say, hey, what is your time zone configuration? And as you can see, we've set our time zone correctly. Now, for whatever reason, we did not get a new uh, a new NTP server, and uh, oh oh crap, I didn't click save, did I? Nope. Okay, so yeah, click save when you make changes, and if you go back to the UCS manager, there we go. We've got both of our NTP servers. So click save in, in UCS manager, and off you go. So that's an example of one aspect that you can manage centrally in UCS manager. Um, now now that that's already added, if we go to UCS two, and remember we haven't registered this yet. So the first thing we're going to want to do is go into time zone management to make sure that the NTP settings are correct. Um, and we go to this time1.clearSDN.com. Okay, so that should get the right time. If we go to UCS Central, register 10.12.0.25, Cisco UCS. Uh, I'm going to leave it at local for now. Looks like we're registering. Uh, it, you, uh, it warrants a little bit of an explanation. First, In fact, when I was first setting this up, I thought that there was a lot that needed done with certificates. You don't actually have to change anything with certificates. It can use the default key ring just fine. Now, it doesn't. I don't believe UCS Manager, uh, or at least UCS Central Integration, supports third-party signed certificates. So if you really wanted to define your own certificate, you'd have to self-sign it. Um, you know, obviously read the release notes for, for the facts on that, um, but I do know that that's uh, on, their, on their roadmap. They'd like to support third-party certs because a lot of folks have those uh, third-party signed certs. So UCS Central is registered, uh, or this UCS manager is, is registered to UCS Central. If we go to time zone management, we can see that we have, have only the NTP server that we defined locally. So same as before, time zone management is now global. We save changes. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's pretty instant, uh, if not, uh, you know, quickly. Oh, there's one last thing we need to do. So in addition to setting this to global, you also have to add uh, the domain to the domain group. Can't forget that step. Equipment. Select the domain. Shows up here. And now we select change group assignment, domain group root. The reason for that is because the policy, the time policy in UCS Central is defined on the root domain group. So we would have to have a domain, part of that domain group for it to take effect. If we go back, time zone management, and we've received it. Okay, cool. So another use case that Cisco likes to talk about when they're talking about UCS Central is the concept of global pools. Now, I get a little, I get, I, it's hard for me to justify using this feature for things like Mac pools. Most of my customers really, really like the ability to, uh, you know, have MAC addresses that are formed so that they describe where in the data center they are. Um, so it really depends on who's doing the implementation. If, if a customer really, really wants that functionality, um, you could also, frankly, if you really, really wanted to, you could still define the MAC pools globally um, in UCS Central, but they wouldn't be really used by any domain other than that domain with that MAC address. Um, so like if the MAC address, let's say the fourth character was a one for data center one, then it wouldn't be really beneficial to put it in UCS Central because really only data center one could ever use that uh, pool. So it, it really is a matter of preference. I, I, uh, if, if you aren't used to doing that and you just wanted to find a big old MAC, MAC address pool uh, to use globally, I say knock yourself out. It certainly saves some time on the configuration later. Um, however, one pool that I personally would use this for is the example that Cisco usually gives out, and that is the concept of a UUID pool. 
So if we go to the servers tab, which is where you're used to seeing UUID pools, and we expand pools, again, very similar interface here. We're not you know, really changing the game as, with respect to our GUI navigation. Global default is the pool that's already set up uh, under the root organization. If we create a block under this pool, and let's just make it real simple, we'll call it, you know, make 10 or something like that. Um, and we'll click OK. So we now have a pool that has 10 unassigned UUID suffixes. So that's great, but how do we use that? Well, as you can imagine, the only way that you can really use it is in your definitions for service profiles and service profile templates. So let's just, let's say we're talking from the perspective of this specific UCS domain. And we've got a, a local UCS administrator whose only only job is to administer this specific domain, but he needs to adhere to a corporate policy to use the global UUID pool. So when he's defining a new service profile, and we don't really have any, let's get rid of this suborg. I hate the default suborg. So if we have a, a service profile, and I don't have anything created here, this is a very blank UCS system, but uh, we'll just click create service profile and get to the point where we can define a UUID, which is right on the front page. We can drop this down, and, and uh, as you're undoubtedly used to, you can define a UUID manual using the uh, OUI that you specify here. You can do the hardware default, so whatever's burned into the server, you can use that. Not a very commonly used option in my experience. You can use the domain pool that's been set up. It doesn't have any blocks uh, on these fabric interconnects, but we now have this other option. As you can see, we can have the global default pool, which has 10 free UUIDs in it. So we can set that up, and then on another UCS domain, do the same thing. And what we've gained is a holistic view of our entire UCS um, domains across our data centers, and we know which UUIDs are used in not only which not only which UCS domain, but which data center, and so on and so forth, because we can track that kind of thing. So that's pretty useful. I like I, I kind of like having the idea to have, or I like having the ability to to define these kind of pools globally. Again, if it gets down to the, if, 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 if I'm using something like a MAC address pool where I'm used to defining a nomenclature that has all kinds of information in it, it might be a little bit laborious to do it this way. And I gotta admit, a lot of the times when it comes to network specific functions, the network team usually likes to handle those things. So if you're in a siloed environment, things like that, you might run into issues. But at the very least, the, the ability to do this centrally is there. So kinda cool. So I'm sure if you're watching this video, you're not happy with just that. So let's get into a little more detail. Let's get into UCS Central once more. Let's go back to, uh, let's go to the Servers tab. I'm already there. Let's, uh, let's actually associate a service profile with a blade. Well, the first thing I want to do is let's uh, create a server pool because I, I, I always, uh, whenever I create service profile templates, I always associate it with a server pool. Uh, let's just call it test pool. This is a, this is a lab, right? So we click next. Search server allows us to search uh, all UCS domains and add uh, servers to them as needed. Looks like we have all of our blades registered, which is good. Um, and let's just select, let's just select all those. That's fine, just as an example. We click finish. Looks like we've got all of our servers here. If we go to the global service profile templates now, and we could cl uh, right click and say create service profile template, Let's call it test SPT. Always make it an updating template unless you really, really want to uh, do some extra work. New UID pool, we'll set the global default that we looked at earlier. Go to next. Uh, and you know what? I'm gonna make it real simple. No VNIX. And for that matter, no, no VHBAs. The server is just gonna be sitting by itself doing who knows. Um, the VNIC, <laughs> there's no VNIX or VHBA, so we don't need a placement policy for that. Boot order, whatever local. Next, global default maintenance policy. Now this is interesting because I'm used to the uh, maintenance policy by default, at least in UCS Manager, set to immediate, but it looks like it's changed to timer automatic in UCS Manager. We'll take a look at that right after we're done with this wizard. Uh, go to next, uh, server assignment method, select server from pool. We select the server pool that we created earlier. We'll leave that at the default and we'll click next. And all of these policies we can leave at the default. We're not going to be doing anything with this. The whole point of this is just to show what it's like to associate a global service profile rather than use a local one. Now, the interesting part about uh, this interface is you might be asking yourself, well, what's the difference between a global service profile and a, and a local service profile? 
I'm glad you asked because if you were to right click on this on this organization, very similar to the way that we did up here, we can create organizations, uh, or rather we can create service profiles here, uh, but we cannot here. Um, the reason for that is if we were to define a, a service profile or a service profile template in a UCS manager instance uh, outside of UCS Central, it would show up here. Um, and what that's letting us know is that it exists you know, on a specific UCS domain rather than defined here globally. So if we define one globally, then it also, as a result, does not naturally, or uh, does, it does not magically appear in a UCS domain as we're about to see. Um, in fact, I'll spoil the story right here. If we go to UCS DC1, we don't see any service profile templates magically show up. And if we were to take even one step further and create the service profiles from this template, we'll just say test SP, um, and it's in the org root. We've created one. And uh, as a result of that, though, since we do have it associated to a server pool, if we go into UCS domain now, we will see that service profile show up, show up. The only reason that happened is because it's now being associated to a blade. If we hadn't associated that service profile template to a server pool, we would not be seeing this service profile here because it would have nothing to do with this domain. So um, that's really what uh, that's really all there is to it. Now you might you might uh, want to make changes here in UCS Manager, but since it shows up as a global service profile icon. As you can see, this is different. It has a little, what is that, a little green circle, something like that. Can't make any changes to this because all the changes need to be made in UCS Manager. Or rather, sorry, all the changes need to be made in UCS Central. So that's pretty interesting. You can still do other things. I mean, you can create a, a, a local service profile template based off of this service profile. You can also do uh, the standard things like KVM console and SSH. We won't, you know, there's no changes to the UCS portion of the configuration if you do stuff like that. So that's cool. Um, so what we've gained here, now the importance to what we've gained here is we've gained the ability to holistically manage our UCS environment through these global service profiles. So let's assume that there's, you know, one guy that manages all the UCS domains. So, so layer 8 or layer 9, depending on your school of thought, political issues aside, let's say that there's one guy to rule everything. It would be super beneficial for him to simply take one pool or however many he wants of server pools, define them globally, and then just simply apply service profiles to various domains as he sees fit. That way he doesn't have to log into the individual UCS domains. He can simply do it from UCS Central. Um, that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I actually pretty I actually like that a lot because it's not uh, you know it's not just simply read only. Um, this is one of the hugest changes between UC, uh, UCS Central 1.0 and 1.1. 1 1.1 1 .1 allows us to do a lot of this functionality that we weren't able to do before. So that's pretty cool. Now, it, it stands to mention also that if you were to go to the network tab and the storage tab, you can do other things very similar to that. You know, you can define under domain group root, you can define your, uh, you know, your, your global VLANs, for instance. You can define, um, you know, the, the Mac pools under here. You can define a global Mac pool. Uh, it looks like one's already created. There's just no blocks. So you can still do a lot of these things. In fact, you can get down to the down to the fact of, of developing your own VNIC templates here globally so that the whole kit and caboodle is defined in UCS Central. So if we did want to add VNICs, we could define those VNIC templates here in UCS Central and simply add them here, making really no local configuration on UCS domain, uh, on the UCS domain itself. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the fact that from just a strict learning perspective, it, it's really, really, really nice to have the ability to load all of this up in a virtual machine. I just want to reiterate that. I, I'm, I'm doing all of this in three virtual machines. All of these configurations I can, I can lab up. So I, I, I got to say, uh, you know, kudos to the Cisco team for this one. The 1.1 release is a lot better than 1.0. Now, the future for UCS Central is going to be interesting, especially with the, uh, you know, the, the advent of other tools. But... Um, you know, it, it, I, I think 1.1 .1 is a good step in the right direction. So that's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video on UCS Central. Please uh, visit my blog, keepingitclassless.net, or send me a note at Mirden on Twitter. And uh, Twitter is actually the best way to get a hold of me um, for really anything. And if you have any comments for this video, either leave them in the comments on YouTube, uh, or feel free to drop me a line on Twitter and let me know what you thought of the video. If there's any other features you'd like me to explore in UCS Central, as you can see, it's extremely easy to lab these things up because it's all in a virtual environment. So please do feel free to let me know uh, if there's anything that I missed, and I'll be sure to cover it in a subsequent video. Thanks for watching.